I know a lot of people are having a lot of good conversations. Let's. Um, we've got three presenters today. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce to you to uh, a longtime uh, friend, um, uh, personal and also of ICCF, who's been really there at the beginning and who does the Lord's work in Africa with with AIDS orphans and. Uh, rhinos and a lot of other stuff, but a, a big hero of, uh, uh, of David Barron's and myself uh, is Andrew Muir, who's the executive director of uh, the Wilderness Foundation uh, in South Africa. He's the founder of Umzi Wetu, which is an innovative program uh, that addresses the HIV and AIDS uh, crisis in South Africa by um, helping um, train uh, AIDS orphans for jobs in conservancies and in hospitality um, uh, industry within South Africa. And we've, we've visited Andrew many times and have, uh, have seen some of the miracles that he's been able to uh, accomplish in, uh, in some places where people might think that is uh, um, impossible. Uh, he's here to obviously to talk to you today about rhinos, which he's also an expert in. Uh, so uh, Andrew, um, why don't you come up here and uh, Well, uh, let me just start by thanking you all for for being here. Um, I know it's a hectic uh, week uh, um, uh, here in uh, in DC, and I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, it's absolutely true what John says, and in, in that I CCF and the Wilderness Foundation and the Wild Foundation go back many years. Um, I first met Dave, I think, 22 years ago now, when I was half the size that I am now, and uh, when my stutter was a lot worse than it is now. So things do improve with age, I think. Um, but uh, uh, um, where this event really, uh, the seed was sown, was in August last year, when um, I hosted a, I. CCF um, meeting in Shamari Game Reserve, and uh, we were there with uh, with four congressmen, uh, Gingery, Chandelier, Cranshaw, and Judge Carter, <clears throat> and we had a meeting with members of Parliament from Namibia, Botswana. Good to see representatives here. Um, as well as members of the parliament from South Africa. <clears throat> and Rhino became quite an important part of that discussion. Uh, we talked about the need for a response and a coordinated res response, educated response, and really to begin to share inf information about what was then and what has now become an escalating issue. As a direct result of, uh, of that um, uh, meeting that we had, um, it was good also to have Volkswagen there in attendance, who've been a key partner in this, uh, was that our House of Parliament in South Africa in January this year um, held a hearing which was televised live um, uh, to the entire population uh, of South Africa on Rhino, the first time that's ever happened in our history. And we actually had a, a very high, high powered, high profile um, um, hearing which lasted a, a, a whole day and into the evening on the Rhino crisis. So uh, the chairman of that portfolio committee was at that group that I've just referred to. And here we are two months later addressing uh, a important group here in DC. So I hope that short little story shows you the power and the work of what ICCF actually does by bringing groups to together at critical times. And indeed with Rhino right now we are in a critical time. But I'd just like to start off by saying that yes, this is about Rhino, but it's a lot. It's about a lot more than Rhino. Um, we are one of 13 million species on this earth. Um, rhino, 
is a charismatic species as we know and is a indicator of the changes perhaps that we are going through as a society and and as a uh, as as um, as our earth just as you would see images of the polar bear on 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 melting ice and that would also be an indicator of change and it really galvanizes hopefully the public to some sort of action so the rhino crisis we hope will galvanize the public to action around an issue which is far bigger than rhino i mean we we are losing a lot of rhino but we're losing uh, thousands of other animals as endangered even more critically endangered as the rhino are so perhaps this is very much a social issue as it is a society issue as as it is an issue of sustainability and where we are as a species in our responsibility as custodians uh, on this earth and hopefully the the charisma and the and 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 the cry that we are hearing right now from the species called rhino can galvanize us as a society to really react in a coordinated way so this um crisis uh, which is escalating, has um, uh, uh, come in recent time uh, uh, um, through the last um, uh, couple of years. It really started in 2008. But I think you are aware, as was mentioned uh, in the MBS footage, that South Africa um, really played a critical role in saving the rhino from extinction in, in the 1960s, 19. 70s and now through different reasons some intellect some that the same we are moving towards perhaps that same time and so what is happening with the white rhino and the black rhino to a lesser degree comes on on the backbone of of really uh, uh, a extinction event which happened i think last year michelle in that we lost the Javan um, uh, rhino, um, uh, so we 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 really um, uh, have once again come back to a point where where South Africa is really the custodian now uh, to probably eighty five to ninety percent of the Earth's r remaining rhino. So what was a success story where we were able to uh, reintroduce rhino in many countries in southern Africa, uh, uh, whilst there are good populations still in, in both Botswana and Namibia, in many other countries, they've become ex extinct already in, for the second time in our lifetime. Uh, and, and so the danger right now is if that core population in South Africa is under threat, it's an indicator really that 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 we are moving back to to a very dark time if we don't react, um, as I keep saying, in a coordinated way. Because there's a lot of emotion flying around, as you can imagine, and what is really required now is consensus, informed opinion, and hopefully uh, informed action. So the rhino numbers talk for themselves. I'm not going to go through that just to say that as of this morning, uh, we've now lost 93 rhino in South Africa. Uh, so that number of 80 was 11 days old. And in 11 days, we've lost another 14. So we're losing them now every 18 hours uh, would be accurate. Um, and last year we were losing them one a day. The numbers are, are definitely going up. You must realize that a live rhino is worth eight times the value of a dead rhino in monetary terms. And that's part of the problem that we are dealing with. Um, you've seen the images. I just want to make one point about this. The reason why uh, dots are, are used, we think, uh, is because um, it does two things. It's, it's, it's a silent method, relatively, in alerting authorities in a reserve that the, 
that a rhino has been taken down. But what it also does when that rhino wakes up and, and uh, eight out of ten times they will die um, once their, their face has been hacked like that. They will walk for hundreds of meters, maybe even a, um, a kilometer or two. So what they do is they, they just broaden the crime scene and that makes it that much harder for us as authorities uh, to prosecute and get evidence because that crime scene can be over a massive area um, in a, a reserve. We know what is driving it. I'm not going to go through that. But I think what I do want to say, though, is that uh, um, uh, there are many um, solutions uh, that have been um, bandied about. And, and I think what we really need to, to do, and it's beginning to happen now, is just make informed decisions by doing proper research and surveys and, and, and studies on what would be the best res response. Poisoning the horn, for example, creates a human uh, uh, rights issue. Uh, um, um, and so I can go on. But there's no doubt that what conservation needs more than anything else is more resources to fight this issue. And so uh, I think there's a lot to be said uh, for re looking at the issue of perhaps a limited trade uh, in rhino, uh, but which, which uh, um, uh, looks at those animals that have died of natural mortality. We pick up about 500 horns a year of rhino that have died of, of, of natural uh, um, causes. And this is what we really worried about. The figure of 2018 there is that with those animals that have died of natural mortality, coupled with those animals now that are being poached, 438 last year, um, probably close to 500 this year, um, is, is a situation where, where we, we could, um, uh, uh, by 218 being a negative population growth, once that happened, uh, it, it can be a very fast move to extinction, literally five or six years. So this is the numbers that we are worried about in conservation agencies. I chair the Eastern Cape Parks Board. We have a couple of thousand rhinos under our, our care, and I really deal with these issues almost every hour of every day now, as we are redeploying staff from key conservation posts just to work on anti-poaching. So what's also happening is conservation agencies aren't doing their full job because they're having to divert a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of time on the rhino, and we are neglecting other important species that we conserve and other issues. So this, this is becoming a real problem for conservation, and it really is partly a resource issue. That's an incredible picture taken in one of our reserves in the Eastern Cape, uh, where we have, uh, I think, the third largest population of black rhino in the world. And here we translocating this animal's alive, but drug, but we're moving them to other ranges. So we're trying to increase uh, the home ranges of these rhino, reduce the risk. Uh, by having populations in as many other areas as we can. So there's a lot of positive news happening with rhino conservation at the same time, which I'm sure Michelle will be able to, to tell you a bit more about. I've talked about some of these actions, um, but I think what I do want to point out here is we really do have a need on the ground in South Africa for for military hardware uh, to really help us, thermal imaging drones that would really help uh, anti-poaching issues on the ground. Right now, we're protecting some areas larger than the state of 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 Israel, um, and and with just a couple of of hundred rangers. If we had thermal imaging equipment, we could turn our anti-poaching teams into rapid response team and not into teams that are s spending all of their time patrolling fence lines where we don't really know where the uh, where the um, 
the poachers will enter from. So th these are important issues. We're dealing with highly organized crime. These syndicates have the best equipment in the world and we really do need to equally have, um, as you heard, uh, the, the most sophisticated equipment that we can lay our hands in to help to fight what has become a war. This is a war on the ground. In the Eastern Cape alone we've lost four rangers have been killed by the poachers in the last 18 months. So it, it is a uh, uh, um, uh, a very um, intense and traumatic time for those tasked with conservation work. And then the DNA process, which is working, uh, is a very important part in terms of prosecution and, and building up a, um, a database so that we can actually have proper enforcement. Um, and then I'll just speak briefly about the work that we as a foundation are doing. But again, I think these are all in the briefing documents that you have in front of you. I'd also like to talk just very briefly about the um, AZA and, and the critical work that they are doing uh, in terms of the zoos. In, indeed, in the 1960s and 1970s, if it wasn't for uh, 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 this organization, we probably wouldn't have had the success that we had with rhino conservation. It was through the zoos that the founder of the Wild Foundation and the Wilderness Foundation, Ian Player, actually um, led the team that saved the rhino from extinction uh, by, by putting breeding populations in areas throughout the globe played a critical role. And this is just some of the many um, uh, uh, objectives and, and, and um, work that they are doing. There's a quote from a doctor play. I think it talks for itself. It really talks about the cry. Any of you that have heard that cry of a rhino will know what he's talking about. And if that doesn't touch deep inside your soul to really tell you that as species on this earth we do really have a collective res responsibility to look beyond the economic arguments even beyond the social arguments to really our role uh, uh, as um, a society at large this really is about nature as much as it is about people and as I said earlier rhino really represent they, they are the uh, the um, spokes animals, if if you like, uh, for 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 a lot of animals that are highly highly endangered currently, um, and so um, that really is a message I think that needs to be heard more. That 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 this issue is not limited to rhino by any means. I also just want to make um, the point that that I think uh, we we uh, uh, do need to um, address this issue uh, with the um, with the view that South Africa is a custodian uh, and we need um, answers that work for South Africa. We need the countries in the world to support a position that uh, ultimately would be carried out on the ground anyway by South Africans. Um, there's a lot of Im emotion, as I said, and I do worry that we're going to spend a lot of time arguing about what to do and not doing what needs to be done. Uh, we haven't got the time for that argument. We have, just in closing, uh, a wonderful history as a country of saving a species from extinction um, and I do believe that we can do it again but we can only do it this time around with the collective action of global society and certainly a American response is needed and it's needed urgently. I thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we're uh, fast approaching our 1.15 cutoff time, but we've got uh, two more uh, uh, quick speakers here. Um, 
Dr. I'd like to introduce uh, really quickly just Dr. Michelle Gad of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, who works on African wildlife, um, including elephants, great apes, uh, and of course rhinos. Michelle. Thank you for having me today. Um, they, uh, ICCF was kind enough to invite me here today so that I can answer the question that many of you will have, which is what is the U.S. government doing about this? Um, I am just a civil servant. I am just a government employee, but um, luckily they let me out today to come answer questions for you guys. So uh, my name is Michelle Gadd. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and within the Fish and Wildlife Service, I work for the Division of International Conservation, which is a uh, well-kept secret. Uh, we are very lucky as a division to be mandated to um, carry out five unique acts that have passed since 1989. And these acts give special protection to five different taxa, largely because they are well-loved by the American public. And that includes only the elephant, rhino, tiger, great apes, and marine turtle. And they've come through individually over the years, and luckily the great strength of these acts is that they came through with funding. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but um, at, at an all-time high for the five groups of animals, we had um, ten million dollars across the five. Uh, roughly that works out to about one-tenth of a penny per American per year, and we are one of the biggest donors in the world to these species. So I think as taxpayers, you deserve to know where your money went and to make a decision for yourself whether or not it was worth it. So I hope I'll give you the equipment to make that decision. Um, in the case of rhino, um, sadly, the people in Congress thought rhino and tiger were very similar, and they put them together on a bill. So uh, for reasons, you know, it was before my time, I could do nothing about it. So we have 2.4 million that we split between Asian rhinos, Asian tigers, and African rhinos. Usually African rhinos only get about a third of that, so we're looking at about $800,000 a year. Now I'm going to tell you what we've done with it so that you're equipped to decide whether or not it was a good use of your penny. Um, th these are a bit washed out, but on the left, is an old history of black rhinos, uh, courtesy of International Rhino Foundation, actually. And the yellow swath is where they should be. The red spots are the only places that they are left. On the right is uh, the distribution of the white rhino. It's a grazer, and it was always restricted to grasslands in Africa. And again, the red are where those animals le are left. Sadly, this is outdated from at least 2,000, and on the white rhinos, we've lost about half of those red patches. On the black rhinos, we've lost the West African Cameroonian one, and we've lost several subpopulations. Now, uh, these, this is how much money we've spent over time, and in the early years, this is way back in 1994, how much money was allocated. And the rightmost bar is what we're facing for fiscal year 2012. So just above the 800,000 mark. Um, some data. I, I do have a PhD. I am a scientist, so I had to put a, some data in there. On the left-hand side, I just wanted to um, emphasize the first five years, or, or 2000 to 2005, versus 2006 to 2010. Uh, that orange didn't go well for me, but um, one small victory is that the fund has nearly doubled in the second five years versus the first five years. And in the first five years, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and South Africa accounted for almost two-thirds of the total funding allocation, um, irrespective of how many rhinos they had, although those are three of the top five rhino range states. In the past five years, I think we very correctly added Namibia to the portfolio um, with great success and um, an amazing conservation success. The rhino has been reintroduced to Zambia. Sadly, at the same time, we have lost all Cameroonian rhinos and officially the verdict is we have lost all of Congo's rhinos as well. So two countries are no longer eligible. Five make up the bulk of all rhinos that are indigenous. Now, what do we do with the money? First and foremost, the bulk of the money is to put boots on the ground. So we pay for anti-poaching um, 
sort of uh, consumable expenses, food, rations, fuel, uniforms. Just getting the people out there who are already committed to doing those jobs and giving them the equipment they need to do it more safely. Um, sadly, in the world of rhinos, most rhinos now do have to be actively managed, and that means monitored very frequently and darted and swapped from place to place occasionally for um, favorable genetic uh, mixing. And uh, darting also routinely for management purposes. This is a uh, desert black rhino, again, in Namibia. And uh, this is a photo I don't share with the public, but this uh, in the bottom right-hand corner is a RFID tag. So this is a transmitting tag for security purposes. Namibia's goal is to have every rhino in the country have one of these tags on board so that if that rhino stops moving, it will be detected within a matter of hours and anti-poaching can respond before more rhinos are killed. So it doesn't prevent the rhino from being killed, but hopefully it expedites a response. Um, also, uh, Fish and Wildlife has been proud to be one of the donors that funded the initial research in Namibia, again, Namibia's the shining star today, um, where they actually tested whether or not slinging a rhino by its ankles was detrimental to the animal. So they, in Namibia, they actually slung it and hung it up from a tow truck and kept it under anesthesia for the time that it would normally take to translocate an animal by helicopter. And they did find it was actually less stressful on the animal. Um, the corticosteroid levels were better, the blood oxygen was better, and they found that the animal walked away quite freely afterwards. So this has now become a standard practice in Namibia and South Africa as well. This, again, is in Namibia. And the reason that, that it has to be used is when rhinos have to be moved out of terrain that is inaccessible by vehicle. Once a rhino is darted, you need to get on it before it suffocates within a matter of minutes. And by using a helicopter and a sling, we, it's made it possible that the vet can get in there and on that animal, get his ankles tied up and get him up in the air very quickly, far more quickly than you would have to would if you were waiting on a ground crew. And again, a, a big success um, that we can say with the Rhino Fund over the years is the successful reintroduction of rhinos to places they once were. This involves capture from uh, populations that are exceeding carrying capacity crating them and moving five rhinos at a time in crates in a C-130 or Hercules. And this brings up a valid point, which is that in many African countries, we are trying to work with uh, the departments of defense, both of those countries and with the US military side. And that comes into uh, borrowing their big airplanes now and then, as well as requesting their help on technology and security. In particular, people are very interested in drones, thermal imaging, and other technology that could help in this fight to save the rhino. And um, the last prong of what Fish and Wildlife does, I hope many of you have heard our good news of, of last week, which was a Fish and Wildlife Service sweep that involved, I think, three states. In the end, it yielded 37 rhino horns, seven people have been arrested, and $2 million in gold and cash have been seized. So law enforcement and the implementation of treaties is another key aspect of fish and wildlife activities. On the bottom right is actually a trophy mount um, with fake horns. The real horns have been moved and sold. So uh, if we look at 10 years overall, we're talking about $5 million. When you think about the prices people quote now for rhino horns, some people are quoting $250,000 for carved Chinese libation cups, which is one of the antique rhino horn items that's traded. So really, we're talking about the equivalent of only 20 rhino horns. It's all the money we've had available in the past 10 years. As I said, the bulk of it over the years has been spent on anti-poaching and monitoring, and some on translocation. But I'd like to end on a high point, which is that in the case of white rhinos, the trajectory from 1997 to present is still very favorable. We did lose the Congolese subspecies, that one flatlined, sadly, during the war. And on the right-hand side, you see four subspecies of black rhinos. Again, the Cameroonian one flatlined, went extinct on the bottom. That was a tragedy. However, two of the other three are still going well, and it is the um, southern black rhino that is most common in South Africa that did take a hit these past few years with poaching. So I think all told, for $5 million over 10 years, we've had amazing achievements with these funds. 
And those are all due to the incredible commitment and heroism of the people on the ground. And that's ranging from trackers and community game scouts to communities that have dedicated their land to conservancies and to the vets and scientists that are behind it all. Thank you. And um, our last uh, presenter who does not have a PowerPoint, but just uh, um, uh, with the Volkswagen Group of America, uh, Anna Schneider. Anna. Knowing that I have about negative 30 seconds, I did some edits at lunch. So I'm just going to talk, talk very, very briefly. Also, you should all be aware that the current issue of National Geographic, page 106, has a very detailed, very interesting spread on, on the rhinos and the poaching activities that are occurring in Africa and Asia. And it's, it's heartbreaking, and I see many of your photos there. So, but I do encourage you all to read it. Um, thank you, ICCF. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Margaret, for the opportunity to speak ever so briefly. I had the pleasure and distinct honor to meet Andrew Muir when I was in uh, South Africa this past summer. Uh, it was Andrew who opened my eyes to what Volkswagen Group is doing around the world. You should know we have a very small foot footprint here in the United States, but we operate in 150 countries around the world and have 62 manufacturing plants. And I'll just give a little plug on our conservation efforts. Our manufacturing plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee is the only platinum lead certified manufacturing plant in the world. So our whole effort, thanks. Our goal is to reduce our footprint on the environment in absolutely everything we do. Um, I had the distinct pleasure, as I said, to go to Shamari and to see rhinos up close. And they are magnificent reminders of a prehistoric time. And they, I saw them with their families. And then listening to Andrew speak, I don't know how anyone can't be touched by what's going on there. Um, we have a, a, one of our premier conservation programs in South Africa, and you should know that our manufacturing plant there employs over 7,000 people, and I really feel like we're making a difference because as we drove from Shamari past the shanty towns to the plant, you saw suddenly little brick homes, and you could tell that we're making a difference. But the biggest thing we're doing is uh, Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles has partnered with the Wilderness Foundation's Forever Wild Rhino Protection Initiative to aid in the proactive rhino protection and anti-poaching activities. And the initiative is concerned with maintaining populations of free-ranging rhinos within the state and privately managed conservation areas. And as we saw, the need is immense. In, uh, since 2006, and my numbers need to be updated, more than 1,000 rhinos have been slaughtered. I, I knew it was 400 last year. I had no idea how horrible it was the pace we're at this year. So last year, Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles announced the donation of 11 Volkswagen Amarok pickup trucks to the Rhino Protection Initiative. The Amarok is not a vehicle you're familiar with here. Um, we're prevented by bringing it in uh, because of a 25% truck tariff, but it's a pickup truck that's not quite as large as a Chevy Silverado, but it's used to roam the, the uh, reserves and try and be more proactive in saving the rhinos. I was actually very excited to share this with you, and after hearing what's going on, I suddenly realized that it's woefully inadequate, and I want you to know that I'm gonna ask that we do more. Um, one of the things, Andrew. <laughs> I would, if anyone has any contacts with the defense industry, they need night vision goggles. They need the same technology that the defense department uses. And if you read the National Geographic piece, you realize it's a war. And they need, Andrew's group needs, the same tech of, type of technology that they're using in Iran. So I'll tell you where they are. The Amaroks were handed over to the conservation agencies in high priority areas of Mumpumalanga, Northwest, Eastern Cape, and KwaZulu Natal. The conservation agencies that will benefit from this partnerships are Sand Parks, Northwest Parks and Tourism Board, Eastern Cape Parks and Tourism Agency, 
hazy and wildlife in Eastern Cape private game reserves associations, and the vehicles will primarily be used in proactive rhino protection and anti-poaching. Our sponsorship of the Forever Wild campaign is Volkswagen's contribution toward the fight against the poaching and preservation of the rhino population. We're hopeful that our little truck will do its part and be a good partner in the, with the conservation agencies in combating future poaching activities. That's all I'm going to say. You saw what the need is, and if you have any contacts anywhere, help Andrew's group. Thank you so much, and um, personal gratitude out to uh, to uh, to Anna for really pushing this with Volkswagen. It, it's amazing where it, what people can do uh, as individuals in in. Uh, uh, in government uh, or in corporations, in, in, in mammoth corporations or very large governments, to, to really make a difference. So um, this is uh, Volkswagen's commitment is 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 I know very appreciated uh, by uh, not only uh, um, the Wilderness Foundation and, and others, but uh, all of South Africa and all the people who love rhinos worldwide. So thanks so much for that. Um, we went a little bit over this time. We haven't done it, I think, in the last two years, so I apologize. Um, we'll try to be a little bit better next time. Thanks so much for coming. If you have questions, please stay for after. Best of luck. <laughs>